Greetings to the Innovative Marxism Research Branch of the World Association for Political Economy. I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Cheng Yin Fu and to Deputy Secretary Lucy Liu for inviting me to contribute to this forum. Imperialism, war, and the urgent need for socialism. Serious pressing issues face our world, the vast majority of which have clear and profound roots in their processes and predictable outcomes of global capitalism and imperialism. A glance at the recent history of the NATO-Ukraine-Russia war reveals that it is largely a product of U.S. and NATO imperialism pushing eastward, really beginning in 2014 with the fascistic U.S. backed coup against the neutral Yanukovych government. This coup was motivated, at least in part, due to the Yanukovych government breaking off negotiations with the IMF. Yanukovych was out of power by February 2014, and by April 2014, the IMF had approved $27 billion loans for Ukraine under Banderite fascistic government of Poroshenko. Uh, Ukraine's open neoliberal agenda was reflected on September 6, 2022, when President Zelensky rang a bell at the New York Stock Exchange as Ukraine enacted privatizations, extreme attacks on labor laws, and has banned communists and left-wing parties. Ukraine banned the Communist Party of Ukraine and expropriated the party's assets, funds, and property. And Poroshenko, when he was in power, tore down monuments of Vladimir Lenin. The anti-working class nature of the regimes since 2014 are clear, and they are reflected in their vicious anti-communism and Nazi Banderite sympathies. Uh, the escalation of this conflict and the U.S.'s, NATO's push uh, to advance it in order to supplant Russia's gas supply to Europe and protect U.S. NATO imperialism and hegemony could also not be more diaphanous. None of this is to say that the way Russia has responded to the Ukrainian and NATO aggression, uh, you know, especially to the aggression that they were that the Ukraine uh, was waging against the people of the Donbas, has brought the solution or the situation any closer to a resolution. Uh, but what this is trying to point out is that the narrative that is dominant in the United States that Russia is an unprovoked aggressor is clearly baseless. Going back further still, one can see how the dissolution of the USSR laid the ground for the current conflict. For decades, Ukraine and the USSR worked together without violent conflicts and fought together against Nazism. With the exception of the Nazi collaborators in, in the Ukrainian insurgent army, adulated under the current Ukrainian government, in particular under Poroshenko, and the tragedy of the USSR's dissolution is still now not fully comprehended. For example, in March of 1991, it's good to remember that 71% of Ukrainian voters voted for the preservation of the USSR and 81.7% voted for Ukrainian sovereignty as a member of the Union of Soviet Sovereign States, something that did not come to fruition. Had the destruction of the USSR, the resulting privatization and impoverishment, NATO expansion eastward, and capitalist restoration not occurred, the horrific waste of human life in that part of the world would have been very likely averted. Capitalism increases the threat of more bellicose conflicts between and among states. These dangerous escalations, in the end, will benefit no one. As socialists, we know that war's fruits are simply sorrow, death, maiming, and destruction for humanity. Those are the fruits of war. We also know the levels of violence that capitalist empires will go to in order to maintain their dominance. All we have to do is remember what happened in Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Chile, etc., etc. Two world wars and countless U.S. invasions of sovereign nations, brutal economic sanctions, 
that tried to maximize the suffering of populations of entire countries with the hopes of toppling governments show the lengths to which imperialism will go to protect international capitalism and its own hegemonic control. Simultaneously, we see other disaster effects of, disastrous effects of global capitalism, exacerbated by the current crisis and U.S. economic sanction regimes leading to rising food insecurity, notably in Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, Afghanistan, and in Yemen. In Yemen, for example, according to the World Food Program, 19 million people are food insecure, as if Afghanistan had not suffered enough since the U.S. began arming the Mujahideen back at the end of the 1970s under a plan to draw the U.S. into its own war, its own Vietnam, and overthrow then Afghanistan's then revolutionary-oriented government. And after the brutal invasion launched in 2001 and 20 years of occupation and bombing with several of a million of Afghans facing famine, the U.S. then steals the country $7 billion in its reserve fund and proposes giving $3.5 billion uh, of Afghan central bank funds to 9-11 victims, who ironically would not have become victims in the first place had the U.S. not supported the Mujahideen terror against the Soviets. The global capitalist system produces extreme levels of economic inequality, making our planet very insecure. Climate change, war, imperialist waste and weaponry, and the inability to direct production to where human needs are the greatest, instead of towards where production is most profitable, lie at the root. The growing insecurity and climate catastrophe are reflected by the rising sea levels and increased violent weather that threatens the existence of small oceanic countries such as Tuvalu and Kiribati, as well as coastal lands of countless other countries. Capitalism, far from showing a way out of the ecological crisis, only exacerbates it and ruptures humanity's metabolism with nature further and further. We live in a world largely dominated by U.S. imperialism, although the hegemony of that imperialism appears to be troubling. The unwillingness of U.S. imperialism to respect international law and agreements, as reflected in the countless invasions of sovereign countries, coups, and other forms of interference, is now put to a new test, as U.S. political leadership will not seemingly adjust very well to the emergence of a multipolar world. A clear element here that we should keep in mind, and that is important, is the U.S.'s determination to maintain what Michael Hudson termed super imperialism through keeping the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, allowing it to export debt as it attempts to print its way out of crises. This issue merits further serious attention. In spite of being at the center of imperialism, however, the United States at home is a capitalist country in crisis. According to a report of People's Dispatch, in August 22, approximately 3.8 million people in the U.S. were facing eviction. Incomes have been stagnant while prices decrease. While this trend has been greatly exacerbated this year due to a variety of factors, it is much more long-term issue reflecting the nature of capitalism that exerts downward pressure on wages. According to the World Inequality Database, in 2021, the bottom 50% of the U.S. population brought in just 13.9% of income, while the richest 10% raked in 45.6% of the income. In household wealth, it's even more extreme. The top 1% owns 34.9%, the top 10% hold 70.7%, and the bottom half have just 1.5% of the wealth, if you can call what the bottom half have as wealth. This obscene polarization is the result of an economy run according to the logic of capital. It is also visible in every single Oxfam report on inequality that comes out year after year. Capitalism just offers an exacerbation of the currently immoral and astronomical levels of inequality. Meanwhile, 
inflation in the United States rises rapidly, further depressing workers' wages. The only solution that U.S. leaders have to offer the population is to further place the crisis on the heads of workers through raising interest rates. They offer no price ceilings, no movement away from capitalism, no transition towards public ownership, no raise in real wages, no decommodification of health care, and no movement away from the waste and evils of un unbridled imperialist militarism, which, as we should emphasize, is also a major force contributing to global climate change. Recent report uh, suggests that the United States military uh, contributes as much uh, as 140 countries to global carbon emissions. Thus, if we want to be serious about climate change, we must do something about the terrible wastes of the military industrial complex in the United States and that branch of parasitic capital. The U.S. plutocratic imperialist plutocracy thus offers no solution to the vast majority of the U.S. population. To the world, they only offer imperial intransigence and hubris. At home and around the world, the logic of capital seeks to depress labor share and works to enrich the few at the cost of the many. Global income and wealth inequality, a product of imperialism, has reached astronomical levels. With vast resources at its disposal, Capital is always seeking profitable outlets for the surpluses it has extracted and gains power and influence over the running of states. This conflict uh, over markets and over control of resources leads to conflict with other nations and creates one of many of the, of the mechanisms by which economic imperialism translates into military imperialism. Nowhere is the phenomenon of capital taking over states more clear than in the United States, where the revolving doors between corporations and government lobbying and the power of the military industrial complex are both infamous and reign supreme. The pernicious dynamics of the political economy of capitalist militarism are reflected in the perverse incentives. The worse for society, the more war, death, destruction, and security, the better for this section of the capitalist class, as with more distrust, more insecurity, more weapons of soul, and the cycle is continued. We cannot have capitalism without the military industrial capitalism. These two condition one another. The severe global inequalities and crises brought by capitalism have made our world incredibly unfair and unstable. We need a socialist transformation in the interest of humanity and the survival of our planet. Capitalism only offers further centralization of wealth, environmental hazards and destruction, and more war, chaos, crisis, and violence. We need socialism now.